also VC funding and the idea of where brands are putting their money and where audiences are going. I mean, Amazon owns Twitch, so there's always that as well. And it's also been interesting to see TikTok and Instagram try to kind of fight their way also into live streaming, but your live stream with a vertical experience on like NPC streams with like gang gang, ice cream so good. Take your CR, take your Kiki, mm, ice cream so good. It's gonna be really different than, you know, you're like your PewDiePie or somebody else that like Ninja that is on Twitch or YouTube. It's like everyone's kind of trying to make it happen, but at the same time, it's some things aren't made to be live and other things are made to be live. And it's just like anything else, the internet as a crowd figures out what works and what doesn't work. And we try things for a little bit and then toss it off. Today, we have with us Ryan Selvey. He's a local based Brooklyn artist and he is fantastic at motion graphics. As well, he hosts the Adobe Live programming and is fantastic at streaming, which I, I, I am terrible at streaming. And uh, me and Andrew actually ask him every question under the sun about the matter. And I mean, wow, this is a really fun episode. And so without further ado, enjoy the episode. Yeah, I guess just a little bit of your backstory. I would love to hear kind of, you know, I don't know if you're from New York. I know you currently are here. Um, did you move here? And then what? how did you kind of get into the field? So I'm initially from Maryland, and I actually worked for an agency down in Maryland. I interned for them while I was in college. And at one point, they were kind of starting to establish more of a New York presence, and they needed an art director up there. So I moved up and worked out of the financial district for a while, which was fun because I was going there and I was wearing a hoodie and uh, jeans every day and walking next to a bunch of people on Wall Street, which was always really strange. <laughs> and then after a while, I kind of got my footing and realized that I could do a lot of the things that I wanted to do without having the overhead of an agency. And then also I could probably have a little bit more liberty over the products that I take on and could really mm. pay attention to. And so when I had the confidence enough, I actually quit my agency job in 2019 and then went full freelance in October. And then the wow. pandemic hit and the pandemic helped freelance a lot. So it was wow. kind of a good thing to have. Obviously not good, but you know. Yeah, no, I mean, it isn't that it was a very interesting sort of, uh, you know, the black swan event of COVID and just how, how the range of people being impacted by that. But there was sort of this flip side of obviously there was a huge uptick in the need for, you know, people that were working remotely freelancing who were able to take on projects and kind of see them through on their own, you know, front to back. Yeah, um, I thrived at the beginning. I, I, everyone was like going through a hard time. I remember I got to like maybe June or July before I had like a bad psychological day with COVID because it was just, I was used to it and I was, used to remote working at that point. And, yeah. um, you know, it eventually did hit just like it hit everybody. We all went through trauma, you know, now it's like three years ago, but it, it was one of those things where it's like, okay, I got this. We're good. <laughs> Money goes up. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I yeah. mean, it's, uh, it's, I, I also worked remotely for a very long time prior to COVID. Um, so I feel like very similar perspective of your kind of just, you ease into it differently, but yeah, I mean, it catches up to you for sure. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad COVID's gone. To be honest with you, that's that's that is just wow. That's a really hot take. It is. COVID's I know you heard that first. On Thank the you. Podcast. Well, you know, it's one of my friends just got it, and I was like, "Wow, way to be vintage, trying to be a hipster and bring that back, huh?" <laughs> nice. We're over it, dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was um, crazy. Another thing I wanted to ask about, um, you know, we we're talking about web comics and sort of you, you mentioned this other, you know, understanding the other side, another side or a side of the Internet, um, you know, like learning discord and, and finding communities that way. Um, I'm also just curious, uh, you know, I, I have your bio here, too, so I, I kind of have some background, but, you know, like old blogging platforms, Zanga, MySpace, uh, what, it was a live journal. Was that one? Yeah, no, um, it's uh, I've definitely grown up with the Internet. And I mean, obviously, we all did storage, but it was something that I've always garnered my interest uh, to a to almost like a nerdy fault. I remember being in high school and like trying to get people to sign up for Twitter back then uh, just because I thought <laughs> it was cool. Um, but I kind of got into all of graphic design, motion design as a result, because I remember getting on Zanga and like fifth or sixth grade and wanting to learn how to change the backgrounds or make something. And a friend of mine had Adobe. Uh, it wasn't even Creative Suite. It was back before there were numbers. And it was like Photoshop Elements. 
and oh, yeah. uh, she showed it to me and I was so blown away that I, I knew I had to get into it. And then over time, things move. Also with YouTube, I, I had a YouTube channel back in like seventh grade and I like to edit videos and I like to make the graphics on top of it. So it was all things that kind of like murmured around and I somehow have made it into a uh, sustainable income. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I mean, the reason I asked too is because like all of those platforms, you know, at the time, it's they're kind of trans, they are, you know, transformative in regards to the internet. It's like, yeah. every, you know, MySpace was a huge deal when it was first launched and everyone had a MySpace and bands were on MySpace. And it was this, you know, this, this sort of community like of culture. It was like photography and, and video. Well, I don't, maybe it was their video on MySpace, but definitely music. Like, yeah. you know, and so the reason I ask all that is because as someone who's as into live streaming as you are right now, like, do you see live streaming as potentially sort of the next phase of, you know, the social internet? It's interesting because it keeps changing. And a lot of it has to do with outside sources as well. Obviously, I know we're talking about lockdown, but also VC funding and the idea of where brands are putting their money and where audiences are going. I mean, Amazon owns Twitch, so there's always that as well. Mm. Um, and it's also been interesting to see TikTok and Instagram try to kind of fight their way also into live streaming. But your live stream with a vertical experience on like npc streams so with like gang gang ice cream so good is going to be really different than you know you're like your pewdiepie um or somebody else that like ninja that is on twitch or youtube there was failed mixer which was a thing um I, I, it's like everyone's kind of trying to make it happen but at the same time it's a very hard thing to pull off i don't know some things aren't made to be live and other things are made to be live. And it's just like anything else. The Internet as a crowd figures out what works and what doesn't work. And we try things for a little bit and then toss it off. Um, yeah. And I mean, to, to this whole conversation about live streaming, too, one thing I'm curious about. So, you know, you you're you're hosting Adobe Live, you know, uh, from time to time. How did you how did you kind of find your way into that? That was based off of the idea that I was already doing live streaming for web comics and they were starting up a user live streaming system on behance which is owned by adobe and they were looking for people to stream on the platform with a creative aspect and mm. i happened to be regular enough on twitch that adobe pulled me from there and then what was really cool is i became um kind of in charge of managing all of the live streamers COVID happened they suddenly went from paying like a dozen streamers to stream to something like a hundred streamers. And so wow. I was reaching out to like hundreds of people that were doing things that I was kind of interested in. And not only was I able to be like, Hey, I like your work and I want to hear how you do it. But I also got to be like, Hey, Adobe lets me give you money. <laughs> so, uh, it was really cool to make a connection. And I've met so many people through that. And then as kind of an outlet after that, afterwards, um, I've been able to maintain those relationships, which is cool. Wow. What would you say makes for a successful streamer in the creative field? I, I think understanding a lot of knowing the format that you're using is a really big deal. I draw a lot of inspiration and learnings from very early TV when we were figuring out TV with telethons or late night shows. I think that too many people treat it in a way that they think that it's almost like a YouTube video and there will be a strong portion surprisingly that watch you from beginning to end or they watch a replay. But I kind of understand live stream for the most part of being people coming in and only taking a piece of when they're there. And then it's up to you or as mm. a streamer to not only keep attention of people, but also be sure to constantly follow up and let people know what you're doing and and bring them in. Because as silly as it sounds, when you first enter a live stream as somebody who's chatting, like most people who are either coming to a new streamer for the first time or they're just coming to the format for the first time. Uh, even though it's just words on the screen, that it, it's scary. It's scary and weird to say hi and hello and, and join the community. Um, and I think that the mm. biggest thing is being able to bring people quickly up to speed, break up segments and make sure that, you know, you can cut things down later if you want to or someone can just understand. Because if you're working on a 20 minute segment and somebody comes in, you know, five minutes in, then they're stuck for 15 minutes being like, I don't know what's going on. So right. when we're doing Adobe Live stuff, I like to do interstitials and I like to break it up with chapters really quick so that, OK, maybe you just walked in. We're not going to necessarily recap what we're talking about because it's so short, 
but by the before you leave, we're going to move on to something else that like then you are there for the beginning of the conversation. Mm, now, so man, I have so much questions. I honestly, I think <laughs> just focusing in a lot on streaming this episode could be really useful because it's something we've actually not talked a lot about, and it's really is just such a booming market. Um, so. How did like you get your start? Because I'm not going to lie. I have tried streaming before. And you want to know what happens? <laughs> I start my stream. Zero people join in. Maybe one person does. And I go, oh, hey, how's it going? And then they leave. And I go, wow, my heart is just shattered. And I'm sitting here staring at myself. And so, like, what would you recommend um, for me or anyone listening like how to get have a successful start. I uh, one already had uh, sort of a community based off of web comics that started the whole thing. Then that kind mm. of was self fulfilling. But one of the biggest pieces of advice I could probably give is you need to have an idea of what you're going to do. You don't necessarily have the freedom and the leniency of being someone who hops on and you like are playing a blind play like playthrough through Mario Odyssey or something. You need to be right. able to come in and be like, this is a segment that I'm going to do. You know, maybe I allot 30 minutes to it, maybe a lot an hour to it. I have done things in the past where I was trying to get better at drawing portraits. So I was drawing a portrait. I had like a little portrait challenge show up on the screen and then I think that overlays and pop-ups are really important for getting people to understand what's going on when they join. So that's a similar something like I, I had the portrait challenge. It was up in the corner when I was working on portraits. Mm. And then when you came in, you kind of understand the parameters as to what we were going to be working on and what was happening rather than going on and just kind of being like, hi, how are you? What do you do you want to see me draw? <laughs> like uh, giving some sort of structure to it is always going to benefit you because then you can always break that structure and get silly outside of that. But it's mm. nice to have something to lean on. I like that. That That is great advice. Now with the chapters, I think that is brilliant when people say like, oh, what's going on or jumps in. They don't know what's going on. How do you manage the chapters? Is that something that you just bring up or is that something where you have an automated kind of sign that pops up and it says we're on this chapter kind of like espn sidebars or it shows yeah. you what you're moving on to next how, how do you go about um showing the format to this well I, I really like the idea of the espn sidebar i really like to have any sort of visual indicator that gives nonverbal cues which is always mm. nice but for a lot of the Adobe live takeovers or what have you, I like to really have something that takes over the whole screen. I get a lot of inspiration also from Jackbox games. They are really good at being able to break their games up like yeah. Jack in the box. Uh, or, or no, you don't know Jack. Sorry, not Jack in the box. You don't know Jack uh, is really good at, at splitting it up and making a 10 minute game go by very fast because even if you're losing, you have fun with the next segment that starts. Mm, that is brilliant. I'm I'm so how do you even I mean, again, I, I'm gonna be as truthful as possible here. I, I it's been a while since I've streamed and I almost know nothing. So I do remember, though, being on Twitch and it's kind of was somewhat of a complicated process like two years ago when I was doing it. And I didn't necessarily I saw some people had frames and it sounds like yours almost has like an interactive feel to it how do you go about doing that is there specific software that you need yeah i mean it can work through anything it can uh, when we're doing adobe live stuff i also tend to also lean on Streamyard a bit i i make movie files in after effects and then just export them and have them play uh, in the same way that you would be sharing a video elsewhere but then you can also use different elements from Photoshop or Illustrator that you export PNGs and you drag them around the screen to create a canvas in the same way that you'd be creating for fo like a Photoshop artboard or Illustrator artboard. Mm, and then you can just upload that straight to Twitch, essentially, or well, you'd also be using either StreamYard or you'd be using open broadcast software or you'd be using um, there, there's a flurry of different ones. I use OBS just because it's free. I also mm -hmm. use StreamYard because it's really good with bringing in guests. So if I'm bringing in someone else, I'll use StreamYard. Um, but there's a there's a handful of different ones that can help you be the in between to tell your computer, this is what I want to put online and this is where I want to put it. 
Gotcha. Yeah, I didn't even realize you could use an online platform such as StreamYards to go directly to Twitch. So so with that being said, we are now live on Twitch, everyone. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Makes it a lot more exciting. It's cool to be able to bring in questions that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Um, Mm -hmm. maybe in your prep work or maybe just in the natural flow of conversation. But someone can add an interesting perspective very quickly just from coming in and chiming in from their point. Interesting. So, uh, Well, I was going to say, I love the idea. So this kind of has a feeling or down the path of how do you have an audience member or viewer kind of feel like they're engaged in what you're saying. Now, as a viewer, if they wanted to have follow you or like with you, um, how do you maintain kind of a longer communication or connection with your audience? Is that something where they can subscribe to you? Is that something where you have like a social media page? I mean, what's kind of the method for keeping that connection alive? I mean, it can really be anything. I there's definitely something for routine. If you can develop a routine, uh, I think that goes a really long way. People Mm -hmm. like either, you know, something to be uploaded at the same time or a a live stream at a certain time. I've recently started really getting into Substack and having different newsletters that I. just happened it looks cool though you look like you're on euphoria there we go okay <laughs> I, it's not so, sorry <laughs> i thought i lost power for a second it's just because this isn't full screen it uh my computer fell asleep so mm, okay. got sorry, i can start that over again you're gonna have to do editing on this one i'm sorry no you're good uh, I mean, you're good editing on all of them so yeah yeah but uh because <laughs> no. we are famously not live streaming right now yeah, <laughs> exactly it's, exactly it's, it's useful that's the yeah. other thing though that i will say uh and i I don't know if we'll have to like cut this somehow, but um, no, it's fine. But one thing I will say for live streaming is that things go wrong and you have to really be comfortable with that being the case. I always tell people that, you know, people are just as forgiving as you would expect them to be, because when you're live streaming, everyone is doing things at home on their own systems. We're all used to technical difficulties, especially with the idea of Zoom over the pandemic. Um, and there's Mm. so much to be said about like, just kind of channeling the theater boy in you because so much of it is putting on a show anyway. And the idea that you are deciding what's being put forward and the show must go on. So you're in a lot of time. Sometimes I'll be with Adobe and I'll be working on one of their programs and whether it's because I'm at fault and I am, you know, forgetting how to do a proper key command, or maybe my system's giving up. Uh, it, it's it's difficult sometimes when you're doing something for the product that I'm advertising and it goes wrong. But then you also kind of have to remember that like the home shopping network, like that happened all the time. And people are just, there's something to be said about a poker face. There's something to be said about if you're genuinely actually promoting something, which is where I always like to come from. I I've never really have promoted something for money that I don't believe in, uh, which mm-hmm. I've been fortunate enough to do because I use all the Adobe programs. Um, but being able to take that error and address it in its own way and not have that throw you completely off. Because when I started streaming, so many things would go wrong. It would throw me off and I would be done. And my fiance would call like call it the streamies because I'd get off stream and I'd just be in this horrible mood. Um, (laughs) but I'm I'm getting better at it. (laughs) I love that. That's well, this, this is actually kind of like a perfect segue because one of the things I did want to talk to you about, um, you know, this has come up, uh, on past episodes. It's a conversation we just had, uh, with, uh, Jonathan Winbush on our last episode, just this idea of, you know, someone like Winbush is not doing live streaming, but is making a lot of published video content that is educational in nature and gets tons of comments, not in real time, but we had a conversation with him about, you know, what is the role of the audience in terms of, you know, taking that feedback and and taking action on it. So my question to you is, as a live streamer, how much of, you know, how do you handle criticism or feedback when not only is, are you probably receiving a lot of it, but you're also receiving it in real time. Like, are, you know, how do you prioritize the things that you address? You know, how do you prioritize taking that feedback and bringing it into, you know, maybe changes to future streams? Right. I, I think the real one benefit is that when Adobe built out their system, they really did a really good job somehow at navigating it in a way that they're weren't many trolls. And also they also hire people that during Adobe live streams, they, um actively have moderators that they pay for but 
in my experience, it's a very different community, which is really interesting to me when you hop between the different live streaming platforms, you have to also be like understanding that you're essentially bar hopping and each bar is going to have its own group of people, even if you bring the majority of the people there. Um, and so when I'm streaming on Twitch, my expectation of someone coming on and being like, you suck at art is going to be a lot <laughs> less important to me, honestly, than if I was streaming on Adobe and someone comes on because that doesn't happen when I'm doing it with Adobe. Um, and, you know, it's 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 all about just knowing that there's always a possibility, you know, as an artist, you always have to kind of come to terms with the fact that someone's not going to like your work. I can't say that I am perfect uh, with being able to navigate that, but it is something that over the years I've gotten better with being able to just disregard if you hear it, mm. as, as long as it's unjustified, you know. If right. Yeah. And so, so I guess that also leads me to to ask. So, what are the you know? I guess let me think about how to phrase this. Um, what are the things that you're getting from live streaming as an artist that makes putting yourself in that kind of vulnerable position as some people might feel, you know, being live is vulnerable, opening yourself to criticism, comments, that kind of thing. What are the things that you're getting out of it that makes it worth it to you? One is the connection and the networking with people from all over the world that have a similar interest with me. I am working from home, so I am home alone a lot of the days. And it's really nice to be able to have an outlet where it feels like I'm talking to coworkers or colleagues. And uh, a big part of it is just being able to, you know, channel the idea that I'm entertaining someone and be able to also build my portfolio by just kind of existing. And I just find it such a fun and entertaining experience. I, I like to put on a show and mm. I like to also learn things while I do it. So a um, few different reasons, but. I wanted to ask, so just being on track with Andrew's question and kind of going off that, when you have a bad stream or the streamies, as you called it, but when you have a bad stream, how do you get out of that funk? Stepping away a lot of times. I, um, yeah, it's mostly just having to step away and, and kind of take time away from it. I have gotten better at it you know it's just it, it's it's tough i feel like we all went through it whether you stream or you don't stream just having that interaction online i think can become very negative and you can get really stuck there so i always like to have a network of people that also understand where i'm coming from a lot of friends that i've made through web comics still have the thing because it also happened with web comics where we would post something and it would get you know, like 200,000 likes, and we'd be on the top of the world. But then when we posted something the next day, and it got like 3000 likes, that was crushing. It was like, are we not funny? Is it the algorithm? Uh, like, what did we do differently this time over that time? Um, is that the biggest we're ever going to get? So like, it, it just moved the goalposts every time for more disappointment. And I think that people mm. are really realizing that uh, law across all platforms. And we have to learn to check that mentally <laughs> yeah like reframing what is success and like yeah. you know I, I would imagine that probably also brings up a lot of questions of like why are you actually doing it right i mean if yeah. if you find yourself in a situation where it's why am i not getting the likes that i got before or what you know then you're it, it sort of i i would imagine becomes a question of motivation too so yeah i agree hmm. yeah it's interesting i i'm really just getting into again i can't stop it, but trying to get myself into the mindset of streaming and kind of this, I've been just talking to a lot more friends who have been actually watching streamers. And I still, uh, cause I myself have not ever watched somebody just going on the computer and doing a live stream. And I do find it completely fascinating. Is there any creators or shows that you would recommend? Obviously yours is number one. Um, but including yours, is there any other streams that you would recommend people maybe watch that are first time um, audience members? Yeah, I obviously got to know a lot of people through being able to work with so many um, through Adobe. Uh, everyone on the Adobe staff is, is really great. Everyone has different expertise in different things. I, I find myself 
really going towards live streams also just in the chat as a means of kind of having someone in an office next to you talking and you can chime in when you want to chime in. Um, mm. I really like Wade Cuff. He is a illustrator. He does a lot of fantasy art, um, which is not anything that's close to kind of to my field, but um, he's really good at being able to just hold conversation and also kind of discuss art. And you can also kind of see his process. If there was someone that I really enjoyed watching that was closer to my work, it would probably be E.C. Abrams. He does a lot of things with motion and he'll be in After Effects. And a lot of times he will do things that I just do not understand whatsoever. <laughs> um, but watching his streams, I can maybe pick something up that I can learn more about. Mm, what would you say is the perfect formula for streaming? And to elaborate on that, would you say it's making the greatest work ever is the number one thing? Or is it being as entertaining and people just want a friend to listen to and talk to and they want to see your mistakes. Um, how would you balance kind of that? Show your all your mind? mistakes. Honestly, I it's once again, it's knowing the format. It's knowing that this isn't a YouTube video that's been cut down. It's not Instagram where you're supposed to put your best foot forward. It mm. is a thing that is totally understandable that maybe you draw a circle three times. Like, it's so relieving and comforting to be able to see industry professionals go on and create things in the same way that I create them, where it's like maybe it takes some time um, because also you can learn through other people's mistakes or you can also cross information over the idea of like maybe someone does something weird and I can chime into the chat and respectfully you say, hey, just let you know, you can do that in three clicks rather than 12. Um, and mm. I think being able to just put forth your authentic self really makes it a better experience for everyone. I think that with that in mind, you can still keep entertainment in mind and try to find ways to keep things interesting. I like to, when I stream on myself, I like to have small segments that I take breaks from what I'm working on to once again, kind of move things along and bring people who maybe have fallen off from chatting uh, back into the conversation because, you know, it kind of becomes white noise at a point. And if you have a quick segment where you talk about the question of the day or uh, art that you're interested in or news articles that came up, then people can come back in and be like, oh yeah, I know that thing. And so then by the time you hop back into the art, they kind of check back in and say, oh wow, last, since last time I unminimized you, um, this has gotten a lot further. Mm. Um, do you find that it's helpful to guide people to follow you on other social platforms or do you think that them just liking you on Twitch is enough? Is that something where you're constantly saying like, oh, make sure to follow me on the or there, you know? Well, um, one thing I'm really ready for, and it's gonna still be another decade, but I'm really excited for the Fediverse and the idea of being able to use different, like, account, not different accounts, different uh, platforms under mm. the one same account. It's really weird and I think very of its time that for the last, 15, 20 years, we have been very systems based of, you know, your Twitter followers or X followers are um, over there and your Instagram and your TikTok followers over here and they don't kind of converge over everything. Yeah. So as it stands now, I feel like it's important to have people hop around. My favorite is Discord. I think that's the best place to uh, land a community. But I do think that every platform has its benefit and it's very, very hard to get people to jump platforms, but if you can do it, it's great. Wow. Interesting. Uh, that is, I love the XR motion discord. <laughs> if anyone else is. Uh, yeah. We it's a, that's actually been one of the, um, we, yeah, the discord has been a very interesting place because I feel like I was already late to it when we picked it up for XR. And then once I started getting into it, I was like, as someone who loved Slack, uh, you know, when <laughs> Slack first came out and then just seeing how it's basically, you know, it is so community discord is very community oriented. And so, yeah. um, I feel like it, it was, it shouldn't be surprising, but it was surprising at the time when it was like Discord, or the XR Discord. It's it's great. I love seeing people share jobs and you know help making making connections between artists and getting feedback on work and like again so much of that becoming as you mentioned, Ryan. Like the importance of that 
for more people going freelance or, you know, post in a post COVID world where people are maybe more isolated and not doing the traditional going and working in an agency or a studio for 12 hours a day, surrounded by other artists, you know, to have that, to, to have a space for that, um, is amazing. I would say the only thing about discord that I got overwhelmed with is like, I joined way too many servers <laughs> and I just was like, every, sometimes I open discord. And I'm like, how do I have 15,000 notifications across? Oh yeah. Channel? Notifications don't mean anything anything in Discord. I, mean, I, know. I, I have muted probably 30 of the servers that i'm part of yeah and most I, like, of my I, servers i think are, are muted i think i check like five or six a day mm. and I, I flip through them very frequently i think that when facebook died uh one of the biggest shames that died with it was facebook groups people groups, really liked yeah. facebook groups and facebook events and it has been a long time coming for those things to be replaced um I really like yeah. Party Full now for events. If you guys have not played with Party, Party Full, I have Party not. Great. Um, it's really cool. You, uh, they finally launched an app uh, this month, but it is a like a URL that kind of goes out to everybody, and then you can even set it up that if a friend wants to have a cover for an event, you can go and it links to Venmo so that you can RSVP, and then it's like here you go. It's ten dollars a person, and flips over. Oh, and that's amazing. Mm. I mean, you have so many. Um, as someone who's currently. Uh, uh, planning a, a very very small wedding but a wedding nonetheless and has has had like a couple surprise 30ths in the last couple of years for for friends or whatever there are so many platforms that are trying to solve the like even just digital rsvp digital invitation yep. getting invites out and stuff so and and right now it feels like the ones i've interacted with are pretty segmented right like there are yes. there are ones specifically for weddings or specifically for you know a, spe a, a certain type of event so um I will definitely have to check. What is it again? Partyful? It's called Partyful. P-A-R-T-I-F-U-L. I will definitely it's check it out. It's been something that my friends have used for parties. I've used it for parties myself. Um, and it's just a really, it's the best one that I've come across in a long time. Because uh, obviously there's like paper posts and stuff, but this is the one that yeah, definitely I think works I, the Paperless best. post I've used. Zola is like a wedding one. I mean, mm -hmm. they're and they all kind of have similar functionality, but um Mm. This is so this is interesting, too, because, you know, another thing I, want, I love all the live streaming conversation. But one thing I did want to talk about, too, is, you know, once we get into the sort of future side of things, um, which we always like to do on the podcast towards the end, I do want to talk about asteroid fields. And don't let me forget, uh, we'll pick it up uh, just talking about that in general. But I also saw that you did some in-person events with Asteroid Fields. And I have a couple questions around that that I think kind of pair well with what we were just talking about. But um, taking a, a step back, so I know about your Asteroid Fields project. Can you tell us a little bit about Asteroid Fields? How did you start it? And what are you most excited about working on it? Yeah, so I turned 30 back in January, and I was kind of at this point where I really wanted to make some decisions as to what I wanted the next decade to look like. I don't think I'm going to die at 40, but it is just something where it's like, okay, I did this in my 20s, and I was grabbing my footing. What am I really passionate about? What do I want to do now? And there is a lot of things that repeat in my life, whether it is like an IP that regularly follows or this interest in technology. And one thing that I really realized was that I had this strong connection with the internet and i had this strong this strong connection with like web3 which is in a dumpster fire right now but i still love um and then i also have this connection with animal crossing and i got animal crossing back when it was on gamecube um and i absolutely love the idea of this digital companion and i've always wanted something to be a digital companion and it just feels like what i want I keep thinking someone else has made it and then I'll download it and I'll use it. And people just don't have the things that I have in mind. So when I turned 30, I was like, what is something that I really want to see and bring into the world? And in the next 10 years, I plan to create a uh, video game or an app based off of these cute little aliens that you have that you can interact with on a daily basis that then also reflect your physical world while also kind of maintaining this fun digital world where you can world build and have fun. That is amazing. Um, and so it, it's, you know, you, you mentioned, I feel like there's a lot of different tech pieces we can talk about here. Um, yeah. But it sounds like just from a web three standpoint, um, you know, how are you leveraging certain technologies, maybe like blockchain stuff, NFT stuff um, to sort of support the asteroid fields project? Yeah, so I'm really interested uh, once this gets published and uh, put up uh, where the NFT space is going to be because today it is dead in the water. But I think that um, it is something that I have seen 
burn to the ground and rise from the ashes over and over again. And there's just too many people in it right now that are interested in it, creating things on it that it will manifest in a way. I don't necessarily think that, you know, um, 99% of the projects that were, you know, mooning uh, are ever going to get anywhere close back to where they were. And we're not necessarily going to use NFTs in the same way that they were over time. But I do really, really, really love the idea of just a universal internet and the idea that different developers can all access a singular public ledger to recognize users by their will. So you'd be able to log into Adidas and they'd be able to tell that you also um, have logged into Starbucks with that same thing. And maybe there is a coffee reward in your Adidas because of your presence over with Starbucks. And I think that when the metaverse still uh, was what everyone was talking about, everyone was talking about the idea that like you would get an Adidas shoe and you'd be able to wear your Adidas shoe in Minecraft. You'd be able to wear that same shoe in Fortnite. You'd be able to, um, I don't know, have that shoe on a t-shirt. I don't know. But mm. what I really see it as more so is like, it's not always going to be the same object and it's not always going to be the same reward and the same acknowledgement between all services, but the opportunity and possibility to recognize a group of people who all have a singular vision popping around the internet, I think is very cool as long as there's consent from the people that are doing it. Obviously cookies aren't great when you don't know that you're being tracked. Whereas if you were to pull up something like Astrid fields and you'd be able to go to different services and the promise and the give of that would be that it can be recognized and you can get something that acknowledges that on all different services. It helps build community. It helps reward people that are investing in an idea. Um, and I think that there's so much potential for where that could go. Long yeah, answer. That is, no, no, that is like, <laughs> I, I feel like you're also just, that is the synopsis for, there are so many aspects of web three that I love that yeah. I think unfortunately are not the things that uh, people were excited to talk about when it launched, right. you know, w not when it launched, but like when we had the NFT boom and, you know, yeah. people selling uh, however many millions of dollars worth of digital assets. And suddenly it's like this rat race to be like, you know, I gotta, I gotta make NFTs and I gotta sell stuff and we gotta figure out utility and all this stuff. It yeah. sort of overlooks this sort of, sort of core principle, which so much of what you've talked about, not just with the Asteroid Fields project, but I think with your live streaming as well, is this idea of, you know, make bringing everything back to connection and, and, you know, having, we spend so much of our time on, on the internet and on digital devices, even not even just in front of computers, our phones, our smart TVs, you know, everything is so hyper connected and we're always plugged in, but yeah. it, but we have kind of, I think in a lot of ways, it has made things feel more isolated. And I think there are so many aspects of web three and projects like asteroid fields that can sort of re you know, rewrite the narrative a little bit about like, what does it mean to be a part of a community in a digital space? Um, yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. long answer, but like, I think you nailed it. I mean, that's a hundred percent the things that I think about uh, that I'm excited about for the future of, you know, the internet and just where all this is headed. Um, There's also something like you never really saw up until this year, the idea that any of these platforms could really self-destruct. Obviously we saw kind of the downfall of Facebook. We saw the downfall of MySpace in ways that the culture kind of moved on. But this year in particular was the year where um, Twitter has now changed into something else because of the owner and decisions that were made um, based off of something that was out of user's control. And it's really interesting for all the friends that I have that have built communities and groups of followings on Twitter that they're like, yeah, it's just all the people that were on it no longer want to use this service because this, this, and this, and you know, I'm, I'm being blocked here and here. Um, and that all of that hard work doesn't substantiate to anything anywhere else because Ugh. there's no connection. It's just, I can't, it all I lives mean, on uh, Twitter. maybe it's, it's like such a selfish yeah. take, but like as someone who didn't really, um, amass a following on Twitter at any point, um, that, you know, hearing that is just like, I can't imagine how devastating that must, must feel. Yeah. And, and I, you know, it's interesting, this conversation also so many times when I, when I'm talking about this with people, it also makes me think about the concept of like open source software, which is something I've always been really interested in, which is so much about like 
basically giving the users or the community in the case of, of web three, giving you the authority of, of, you know, uh, like with open source software, it's sort of like you're no longer dependent on, or you're not entirely dependent on, you know, in the case of Twitter, like the, the sole decisions of one person buying the company and deciding to change everything. And then suddenly you're, you know, in, in this case, like your livelihood can be impacted. I mean, that's yeah. once you start yeah. seeing those real world implications of those decisions that are being made on the internet or in a digital space, you, it does make you kind of suddenly think, okay, like, what is my role in this? What authority do I have? You know, you mentioned cookies too. Like that's a, that's one of those it's been, cookies have been around forever. And I feel like most people, you could have a conversation with them. They, they wouldn't even really know how to describe what a cookie is or what it does, right. but it's like, yeah, they've, they're there. Every website you go to, you're, you're getting tracked, you know? So well, I, yeah, also, that idea of I, I just read this article this, uh, this week off of the privacy breaches that your car has against you. And basically Mozilla did this big research uh, study about how much information that your cars are actually pulling about your information. And they're pulling like your sexual history, they're pulling your, uh, your shopping habits, your, um, oh, your music the, taste, yeah. and they're, they're, they're putting it all and like 85% of all of the manufacturers that they looked into, we're talking about like BMW, we're talking Honda, Toyota, like they all take it and they sell it to other yeah. people and then well, 57 percent are fine with also giving it to government upon a like a, a quiet request so not even like a warrant not even like a higher court situation like a government can just go hey we think you have this information about this person can you pull it up and most of the companies are just like yeah it's so <laughs> funny I, mean, I had a uh, friend he was a programmer and um it, let's just say he uh, was pretty crazy. He was always doing a lot of drugs, but he would come to the coffee shop we went to and he'd we'd always play chess with him. This was like 12 years ago. And he had a modern car with a built-in GPS in it. And one day he had, he thought he was Jesus Christ. I'm not even kidding. He, he pulls us all to the side of the coffee shop. He asked us all to take back in the day when you could take your batteries out of your cell phone. He made us all take the batteries out of our cell phone and goes, guys, I'm Jesus Christ. And you're like, oh, OK, buddy. Oh, and uh, long story short, he is before he left so that he was like, I'm just here. I am only here because I need to leave, but I have to sell my car because the government is tracking me and my GPS and he's like, and they can all find me. And we thought he was crazy. So it's just funny. Like 12 but Jesus later, was onto something. Tw yeah. tw Jesus was, he was a prophet. <laughs> so, well, and, uh, and you know, and then, uh, like but really the last thing he said is, so he, we were like, we don't know where to do it. Maybe go, just go to CarMax or something. He's like, that's brilliant. And then he walks out of the store. I'm like, where are you going? He's like, uh, my friend said, I have to go to Pennsylvania and that's where I'm being called. And I said, when will you see you? Uh, when will we see you again? And I swear, this was the last time I ever see him. He goes on CNN and then just walks out of the store. And that was the <laughs> last time we, ever we haven't seen him on CNN yet. But uh, right. one We're day, that's everybody. where Wolf Blitzer is from. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, that's the but origin making, story of Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> but making um, a full story about everything, it is just interesting that we're in a day and age where I just saw a TikTok and somebody was like, oh, do you have a Tesla? He was like, Hell no. He's like, Elon Musk is making AI right now. He owns your satellite. He owns your internet connection. He can own your social media. And now he owns your car. Like he, all of that information is being turned into metadata to make a profile on you that, that can manipulate you in any way. I don't know. Yeah. I thought it was pretty interesting. I mean, it's a little conspiracy, but I mean, no, I well, mean, I mean they, they're, you know, yeah, it's, X is updating their terms and everything. Like they're all updating yeah. terms to say like, yeah, we can take your biological data. We can take all this. It, like, it just happened with threads, right? Like everyone yeah. who signed up for threads, suddenly it's like the day after threads launches, people are like, oh, it's kind of weird that it's collecting my biometrics. Right. It's like, and your medical uh, info. It's like, yeah, why do you like, need my medical info threads? <laughs> like, you know, in the, and it, it makes me think, um, Wow. Uh, I th what was it? Domino's like uh, several years ago, Domino's comes forward and they're like, we're not a pizza company. We're a tech company. We that's how we view ourselves. Right. <laughs> and yeah. like you, you start to d you dissect that a little bit and you realize that like every company is a data company now. 
I mean, yeah. that's just, that's why every company has their own app. It's why every company has their own, you know, I mean, it's because tech is so heavily integrated into our lives, you know, that sentiment makes sense. But like the second you start thinking about what the implications of that actually means, yeah. it's like exactly to your point, the, the article you were just referencing, Ryan, like they collect data, not, not even to make action, some, I'm sure make actionable, you know, uh, to take action on the data they have on you in terms of their services and products, but it's also like a fail safe worst case. I'm just going to sell all this data to somebody else who wants it. I mean, mm. there was a, a very good, um, uh, John Oliver episode that talked very specifically about the, the marketplace of selling just troves of data, collecting data yeah. just because it will, you know, if you amass enough of it, it can be really valuable. So mm. I don't think, it, you know, I mean, it, it, again, it's like, it can be, it can feel conspiratorial, but like everyone's got a phone in their pocket. Everyone's got basically access to the internet at any given point. I, I, I wouldn't say everyone, obviously there are certainly underserved parts of the world that are not as well connected as, you know, we are here in the U S but, um, it's certainly something to, uh, to consider and, uh, to bring it back a little bit, I know we kind of went on a tirade here, but this also leads very nicely. I feel like, you know, I, we were talking earlier about just, uh, the idea of web three and, and building, di you know, online communities, um, you know, you as a live streamer, building community, uh, interacting with people. Um, I also saw that asteroid fields had an in-person event in prospect park in Brooklyn. Um, kind of curious, there are a few things I want to ask. One, what was the event like? How to go? You know, uh, as someone who's had an NFT and like maybe there's real world application, I'm always curious to to hear how that kind of uh, community building goes. And then two, um, you know, what made you what what motivated you to say, let me take this out of the digital space digital space and and kind of bring it into the real world. Well, the one real disappointing part is is it got rained out, so it's getting rescheduled. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> um, but the second part of it, honestly, is a big part of why I created Asteroid Fields was there was um, big political movements uh, a few months back where I really felt like I didn't have a platform. Obviously, I was creating things, um, but I couldn't really like mobilize any sort of change because my um, my senator agreed with me. My city agreed with me. Like I, I couldn't go out and protest because I kind of aligned with the people around me. So Astrid Fields also is this part of being able to bring together a group of people around uh, like core values. And I think that uh, bringing an in-person event into that, I think really is something that can't really be uh, compared to anything digital, at least as it stands right now. So it was really a way of just trying to get a bunch of people to get to know each other through their digital shield, you know, and being able to break that barrier and being able to really build a stronger community because you can build really strong community online, but I don't think there's anything that can really compete with physical. And I love to go to the XR motion meetups every month. And the people that I meet there, I have a much stronger connection with online than yeah. the people that I still met through the discord of XR motion, but I haven't necessarily met them face to face. Yeah, no, that's so true. And it's, that's um, a great point. It's interesting, too, because I think back to this idea of, you know, uh, you see a community that's thriving online and it it in some ways can almost feel more measurable, right? It, yeah. The metrics of likes or comments or interactions, right? But there is, I, I agree with you, I think there is sort of a... Um, there's a more, there's more fortitude to an in-person connection. Like it's, it's much harder to uh, no, you know, some, some, no one's going to buy Twitter and change it to X. And then suddenly you're not friends with the people that you've met and that you've, right. that you've been friends with. Right. Yeah. Like, but if it's purely digital, it becomes much more, you know, vulnerable to that sort of change. So, um, that's awesome to, to hear that you're, you're taking this kind of broad concept of what asteroid fields is about. And then also, you know, sort of bringing it into the real world, real world. Um, also the technology is not there yet entirely. I mean, it's also interesting, you know, Ticketmaster is starting to experiment with the idea of NFT tickets, um, and the idea of those being interchanged, but kind of going back to the idea of a membership and having access to an area through an NFT, I think is very cool. Um, as with anything else, like so much of it got overhyped and like there's no reason why something needs to be hundreds of thousands of dollars for a pass. Um, but there is something cool about kind of having a collection of people that you can then also pass around through the ledger and then have 
physical access to places um, because you have purchased something, which is cool. Yeah, no, I love it, especially when it's long term and just reflecting on X and how you might hate something and you bought something on, say, on that platform or on a different site. And now all of a sudden you don't even want it anymore, but you have so much just emotional value and all these things. Well, that's yeah. When you have an NFT, it's like yours and you don't it's not attached to anything except to yourself, which is pretty yeah. cool. It's really it's, it's a really cool concept. And I even just like before you're saying oh, it'd be so nice to singular or make everything kind of come together because there's so many platforms coming to one. But at the same time, we then went on to a trail of saying how it kind of sucks when one person can control everything and then just then they have all the power. So, it, I, you know, going on to the Web3, I just bringing it back. It is I just the more we talk about it, I just love the idea of having your own space where you control all of your data and you control what gets out and what stays with you. I don't know. It's it's got, I'm excited about the future. Yeah. I'm also I, on um, a social down now, which is kind of cool. It's friends with benefits They're They were one of the original ones. Um, and I didn't join until actually recently because it used to be so expensive. But now that everything's dying, mm-hmm. I suddenly can buy my spot into places. And uh, it's really interesting because it's j- just a bunch of tech nerds that are interested in the technology and the idea of governance across a group of people and being able to tie that along to a social setting. They have like a festival every single year, which they all get to go on and plan. And right now there's even a change in leadership and they're bringing in and you come in and you vote based off of how many tokens you have and you go and you can, you know, bring forth proposals and people can then debate it and say, we want to change this and change that. And then like what goes through, um, and that is something closer to what I think it's things are going to turn to right now. It's still mm. very complicated. It's hard to explain that to people. Yeah. But I, it's where I see the Internet going. Is, um, is um, it that uh, Friends with Benefits is the is your influence weighted by your ownership of tokens or is it just yep. you have to be a token holder to vote at all? You're so, so you get more votes if you own more tokens. Exactly. And okay. part of their token system can also be like, if you contribute more to the community, then you get tokens out of it. Right. So, so you're, yeah. So rather than like the idea of like a fiat currency, your currency, your digital currency is backed by contra- active contributions to the community. Yeah. So, okay, cool. That's um, cool. Yeah, no, I've, I've, um, when I was like really deep in it, uh, DAO, the, the concept of a DAO was, was pretty fascinating. And I think yeah. also, um, it makes me think of this project actually here in New York. There, so there have been for uh, the last several years, uh, people building their own mesh network of you know of internet access across uh, across Brooklyn and and Manhattan. Um, and I think a lot of it is like it's such a good story of you know if you if you live in New York and sorry sorry to make this New York centric. We're all in New York, so I'm sure you guys will, will vibe with it. It's like you have one option for an internet provider. It is truly like uh, the monopoly is real and it is here. Um, you don't really get well, any choice, right? And so then it's also. It, it sort of acts against that narrative. Then it also becomes about like, you know, that, that idea of ownership of things that you are using digitally or, you know, that you're so integrated with. Um, and I think it's like you can, they might run off of like raspberry pies or something. You throw it on the roof of your building and then you're meshed in with all the other ones around you. And then the more people that join, the stronger the network gets, the more fu- you know feasible it is. I think they might have gigabit now. I don't know. Mm. Um, I, I haven't looked at the wow, project really? in a while, That'd but like, sick. Or maybe I think maybe a hundred megs a second because I remember when I was looking at it and considering it as an alternative. Obviously, as as creators of like you know primarily video, it's such a massive amount of data to move across the internet that you yeah. know you have to. And if you're working remotely, which I am, you have to have you know otherwise you're you can't do much with like a ten ten connection. You got to like right. <laughs> at least a hundred megs. Um, so yeah, so it, it wasn't feasible at the time, but I remember thinking like, wow, this is really impressive and and you know, just a community project like that is so cool to see. Yeah, it's also very much needed. Fun fact, I did used to sell internet back in the day. And the reason why the internet seems monopolized in certain areas is because it has to be. It's because of the Telecommunication Act of 1976, in which the government mandated there can only be two providers, providers per area. 
one being DSL going through a phone line and one being a cable connection line. Uh. Lots of reasons for it, but also one of the big reasons was so that there wasn't a complications in line and there wasn't wire clutter. You notice when you look at other countries, there's like those telephone poles with just wires everywhere and then it's hard for them to manage and it looks messy. That was a big reason on it so that everything was a lot more simplified. So wow, you I could have... That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why anytime you look for internet in your area, you're going to have one which is cabled, which is a shared network. That's why when it rains, you're in, you don't have good internet. That's cable. DSL, it's a lot thinner of a wire. So usually it's hard to get 100 MPS, but now it's popular. It used to be like 15 was the max. And that was just like eight years ago. But now they've cranked it up by double stringing the wires. Anyway, DSL... Uh, is usually a lot better now. So you're going to have a dedicated connection where no matter how many people are on the network, right. your internet connection will always stay strong. So I just got, I got so spoiled. It's interesting. I had, yada, I yada, fiber. blah, blah, blah. No, I had fiber for, I had fiber for two years when I first moved to New York and it was yeah. the best thing that could have ever happened. I loved it so much. It was like 15 gig video file to like 15, not even 15 minutes, like 10 minutes. You know, it was it, 18 people in my apartment on my Wi-Fi, you didn't notice a difference in, in, you know, your, basically your router was the, uh, the limiting factor at that point. But yeah. Um, but it's, it's just interesting. Cause it's, again, it's that, it's that idea of like so much of the, you know, the internet is now turning back to this idea of, you know, mobilizing people, whether it's in like a digital space or, you know, as we've just talked about, you know, kind of that bleed over into the real world as well. So yeah, it's exciting times. I mean, I'm just curious about the future. It's so much good food for thought conversation here. Um, and I've got a million other things I could say. We should, uh, afterwards, we'll just all light up and keep talking about it. Um, because, <laughs> um, well, we'll, well, are you going to be at um, uh, the meetup on Wednesday, Ryan? I'm hoping to. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. Yeah, well, we, maybe. Uh, I feel like we have so much we can uh, really get in the weeds on. <laughs> we have to pour one out, though, for the uh, the closing of the bar. It's such a bummer. I <laughs> <Dude>. know. <laughs> Excuse me. Shocking. I'm shocked. <laughs> so sad. Um, that place crazy. fills up with a bunch of motion nerds. Bunch of motion yeah. nerds. I, I keep turning around and be like, oh, yeah, what are you doing? People are like, yeah, I work on digital fashion. I'm like, oh, you're here for the thing, too. Oh, OK. Yeah. All right. Hi. <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy, though. I mean, yeah, uh, I am going to be very sad to not be at Dromedary. I mean, that was. Uh, yeah. It's been years literally so xr motion's opening their own bar that's really cool that would be XR great motion bar exactly you pay in nfts it's going to be great in cryptocurrency wait it's wait what would what would the what would the uh what I would was the say, be there'd be like what the keyframe would have to be something um, right um mm, yeah, rotoscope uh, would have to be something oh of course the easy ease uh the easy easy oh easy ease is a cute one yeah, yeah that's a good mm -hmm. one um I feel like there's a lot. There's a lot to be there. They're trying be to think of like, subdivide. Yeah, I don't know. Subdivide. Yeah, you have to do all the three. Subdivide ones, tour would be a, would be a flight of beers. You know, yeah. that would be. What's the one where you uh, people hate uh, about 3D? They say they love 3D modeling, but they don't like UV mapping. Is that what it is? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> That UV would have to be trash. like the most complicated drink where like you would have to like keep moving it. Here's the thing. So that, UV mapping does That would be suck. like the Long Island iced tea or something. Yeah. <laughs> UV mapping does suck, but you have to be really good at visualizing 2D to understand UV mapping. So it's mm -hmm. kind of an interesting, it, I, you know, I think for if you're purely a 3D artist, I could see why to, you know, thinking about how do you take a 3D object and it's basically paper mache, reverse paper yeah. mache, or like origami rather. Sorry, um, you know how do you fold, how do you unfold a three D object to make it a plane? I mean, it's a terrible exercise. I hate doing it. I when the AI thing was taking over, I was like, or really kicking off, I was like, someone make the AI that just does like perfect UV unwrapping, and I think everyone would be much happier. Yeah, which yeah, I, I don't guess know. they this don't really is... talk much about to that extent. But I like even since the last time we spoke, like my relationship with different AI services has like continued to change. But mm. one of the things that I did um, yesterday was I was working on a piece where I needed a clean slate behind someone. And like previously, I'd have to like highlight them in the marquee tools, switch them out with like maybe like a content aware. Yeah. Um, but I just used AI to like fill in the spot behind her and suddenly I had a clean slate. And then like mm. also like two, three weeks ago, I had 
noisy audio that I had to do for a project and I threw it into Adobe's podcasting like AI oh, yeah. or whatever um, night and day. And it's like, oh, okay, these are all the things that like they're not the huge, huge chatbot things, but they are things is like my life will never go back to as frustrating as it used to be. Yeah. Uh, um, and it's, it's, refreshing. that's awesome to hear. I mean, cause I, I feel like one, I mean, good for you to continue to use the tools, even if you're unsure, because I think the more that we talk about it and the more this conversation goes on, that is real. Yeah. I think the most pragmatic and like, you know, the best take is to just take some time to try to learn them. And, you know, I think every person I've talked to, even, even those of us who are maybe the most uh, hesitant to adopt any of this end up finding something that you're like, Oh wait, that's actually pretty awesome. Right. You right. know, Roto brush is a, an example I use all the time. It's like, if you use Roto brush, you know, you're that's machine learning. That's, you know, the, so many of the core principles of AI and technology, that technology you, you might already be using, but yeah, right. I mean, um, that idea of like audio cleanup of, you know, rotoscoping of, uh, motion tracking, like give me, give me all of it. I mean, we were, you know, the last episode we had with, with, um, with Winbush, we talked about, um, you know, move AI, which is like a, you know, a motion capture app with just your phone. And, and apparently there, so it was originally a, th you know, I think you had to have a minimum of two cameras, um, you know, two iPhones and you'd set it up and you'd sync the app and it would give you like pretty clean motion tracking data. They are now launching a single camera version and the preliminary results are like, it's pretty impressive. I mean, still probably requires some cleanup. You're still going to, if you're, you know, yeah, but like, like so a, what? Like that's the, you, yeah, you told that to yeah. 2015 Ryan. And I'm like, no, that's sci-fi. I don't know. I mean, I and know. also that, that puts out <laughs> yeah. like that we're talking about potentially disrupting like Rococo, which everyone has been like, you know, it's been the like golden child of motion capture for the last like couple of years. Yeah. That, I mean, that's crazy that, you know, a company that was that innovative that recently might be out innovated in the next six months, you know, like it, it sort of, it, it really puts into perspective that like, I think the next 10 years are going to be just a, a flurry of tools that you're going to, you know, hear about and they come and they go and like, some of them are going to be incredible and some of them might seem incredible until the next best thing comes out. But um, yeah. So what other what other AI tools are you working with? Oh man, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, there it seems like there's a new one every single day. I definitely use GPT a lot um, for things that are silly. Uh, I, I don't really use them for expressions very much. I know people have used them with expressions, but I don't know expressions well enough to be able to toss it towards it. Um, but definitely with concepting, um, getting quick rewords, getting emails, mm. using that all the time. Uh, definitely using Adobe podcast, definitely using different image generators to not like, I'm not ever using it to like create art and then push it out, but I am using it as a means to find inspiration to maybe challenge my way of thinking without having to necessarily go and, um, go on like Pinterest. Cause something that I, in my illustrative side, something that I really struggle with is like, I'll find something I really like on Pinterest. And then I find a way to talk myself out of it because I'm like, I really don't want to plagiarize that. But so much of it is being able to nitpick things that you like and being able to take something and have AI output it. Uh, it is scraping thousands and thousands and thousands of people's work, um, which is a whole nother conversation. But by the time it gets to me, if I'm taking inspiration from that thing, then I am at least far enough removed that I feel better about it. So mm. that's another big piece that I really like. There's mm. um there's actually specifically let me look this up so that I can get this right. Hold on. Um there is a uh Joey at School of Motion just did a tw like a a video that was like you know here are three tools that will make you work like ten times faster or something. Um yeah. and one I hadn't heard of it is hold on. Um, before I get into this, uh, so Figma was one I've, and I'm obsessed with Figma. Um, okay, here we go. So design stripe, um, design mm -hmm. stripe is like a, it's not quite generative AI and I'm not even sure what is happening on the back end, but they have these things called like smart layouts and basically it's like stock, uh, vector illustration, but each one of them, um, you know, you open up, you, you know, you find a style you like, you open it up, you're like, okay, I like this illustration of, you know, a bowl of fruit. Um, and then you can start swapping variations of like, okay, instead of strawberries, I want it to be apples, or instead of maybe instead of a bowl of fruit, I want it to be 
um, a bowl of vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. And as you start making these these small design decisions, it automatically starts to adjust like the composition of the layout and, you know, maybe things like color palettes are adjustable. And so it's sort of this like intermediary um, if you're trying to, you know, uh, generate new ideas or if you're someone who does rely on stock vector, you know, illustrative work. Um, it's sort of a more to your point, you don't feel like you're ripping something straight from a stock site. You know, you're, you are involved in the sort of art direction process. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting one too. I don't, you know, I don't know, again, I'm not sure if it is specifically AI or machine learning or what, but it is sort of one of those tools where it's kind of an assistant, uh, if you will, to the creative process. Well, did you um, and see I'm the... on their website and it's 100% AI. It says, say hello to your AI powered designer. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's for Design Stripe? Yeah. yeah. All right. um, did you guys see the news story? I think it was 404 Media was the one that, that did it. But it was a uh, service that was advertising that it was a um, startup for generating 3D models. Yes, but then it yes. just turns out they were hiring like super cheap human labor to like oh, God, make yeah, the 3D models. <laughs> And like that is oh, brilliant. And that's a really that is a really tough one that I saw that story and was like, geez, that is that <laughs> encompasses so many things that are not good about, you know, where where we're at. But yeah, yeah, that was a crazy one because um, it's like what you'd submit the prompt and it was like in tw in like 20 hours, 20 hours, we'll get you something, you know, because <laughs> yep. our and servers, our servers have to run. Meanwhile, someone's like <laughs> frantically <laughs> finding someone on Fiverr, like the person on Fiverr is like freaking oh, out and hasn't slept. Yeah. awful just artists being exploited you know the usual it's fun it's no, cute no, yeah <laughs> classic classic and you know it's it's it, we talking about ai too the thing i that i the one thing that's like the pit in my stomach is i do get a little concerned about just how how much expectations will change of artists you know mm. and just like it's already become a volume game with content, just being a content society of like content everywhere all the time, fast content, attention spans shrinking. Um, you know, part of it is like, I already feel like I don't get all the work done that I want to get done. I get, you know, I get the client work done first. And then by the end of the day, I feel like any personal work is like, you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if that, if suddenly I'm still, you know, expected to do two X, three X the output because that's how fast things are moving now. I don't know. It's just that. Yeah, that technology is always supposed to give us more time, but uh, right. it always ends up just increasing the workload. I know. I know. <laughs> um, so one other question on the future stuff. I feel like a good place to maybe cap this. Um, so I think we, t we did talk about this last time, and I know it was sort of around um, the Asteroid Fields project, but uh, next 10 years where do you see yourself where do you see this industry um and kind of where wh what role do you want to play in that absolutely um i'm really excited about the next 10 years i'm feeling really good about where i am in my career now and the things that i feel comfortable with and the things that i know that i can get better at um and then i also i'm excited about how technology is evolving so in the next 10 years i definitely want to have a gamer app come out with asteroid fields which would be um part of a, a, a new thing. That's the thing that I'm really realizing is I'm trying to point to all these things that exist today to be the thing that I want to build. But the thing that I want to build doesn't exist yet. Um, so I don't even know the name or word for it. So that's one part. And then I'm also really excited about this Play Hop channel, which is the kids entertainment uh, educational platform. And I'm really hoping that that continues to grow and take off. So if I could um, do split my time between Ashford Fields and Play Hop, I would be extremely happy. I just like really making things to entertain and be able to add my voice to the conversation. Um, and I just like to be able to work on happy things. Perfect. Perfect answer. Um, I love how positive you are, man. Um, I, Trying it, to. it really is. I need, I need, I need more of this in my life. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Um, and yeah, no, I, I just I, I, I talk to people all the time about why I live in New York, because as a freelancer, it's way expensive to just live here without any benefits. And I'm not um, going into an office because I'm just working out of my very expensive apartment. Um, that wasn't a flex. That was a criticism of the price of my apartment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> just object of, like what is median rent in New York right now? Median rent yeah. is like, I think for a uh, one bedroom, it's be like, like 2,800, 2,900. No, yeah. it actually went up. It's closer to 4,000 now. 
Oh or median. <laughs> median rent is close to 4000 uh, That's too funny. Yeah. But so realistically, yeah. 2800 if you're moving here, probably 28 I would yeah. say. I think it's uh, got to be that because there's the so many multi... Yeah, exactly. That are paying like fucking $50 million per... Yeah. I don't even know. Yeah. Um, but sorry, you were saying uh, why you live in New York. Is I, I think the big thing that I take out of it at the end of the day is I just like to leverage the amount of connections and the people that I meet, um, both for networking for professional purposes and friendship purposes. I have met so many cool people. I really enjoy going to like XR meetups. I like to go to places where you can meet and everyone's working on something and everything's active. And, and if something's mm. happening in the world, most likely a facet of it is being manifested in New York. Like a lot with NFT stuff or Web3 stuff or motion graphics stuff, there will be a group of people that are within close proximity that you can go and you can meet up with. So I really want to continue to do that. I want to, you know, quadruple the amount of people that I know, you know, it doesn't mean I'm going to be best friends with everyone, but um, I just like getting to know people and, and thinking more of like a, a human race moving forward rather than a bunch of individuals. Cause we finally have the organization and the technology to be able to work together on a grand scale that we never were able to up to this point. Hell yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I do too. That's and I, awesome. that's uh, definitely one of the, the most, um, it's very hard to quantify. And especially when you first moved here, you know, when you first moved to New York and you know, no one, and it's very overwhelming. Um, but you know, I'm going on like eight years, uh, and one, it's very hard to imagine living anywhere else now because I do yeah. have this, you know, you, you get, so you put the roots down and that's true of anywhere you'd move. But the one thing is like, I'm I'm still meeting new people. I'm still making, you know, brand new sets of friends that I, I may be closer with than people I've known longer than, you know, back in like when I lived in uh, actually also from Maryland, like, you know, my high school days, like it's, it's such an, a, uh, you know, it is, it's in a live city and it's, uh, it's a place where you can get any perspective, anytime ones that you ex expect one that ones that you don't expect. And in terms of like sources of inspiration, I mean, you know, you can't be in a better place. Um, yeah. There's just, yeah. there's always something cool happening and you're always, you, you can always find someone to, you know, like we just did get in the weeds on web three and, you know, turns out Mikey sold internet. So now I know a ton of stuff <laughs> about, uh, internet laws, you know, I mean, it's, it's great. So. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, well, I guess the last thing I'll say is, uh, I'm a freelancer. I'm available for work. Uh, I do motion graphics, live streaming, uh, and also non live streaming stuff too. So check out my work, Ryan Selby on everything. <laughs> Thanks Hell for yeah. coming on. Thank well, you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, no, and thank, I look forward and, to seeing and, you guys soon. Yeah, and thank you for uh, specifically coming on twice. And I'm glad I, you know. Again, it still says we're recording, so I don't think we're gonna have a third. But um, we'll have a third when you when you uh, launch some more uh, some more asteroid field stuff. We'll, yeah, we'll absolutely. Do, like, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Ryan. Appreciate you taking the time and we will talk to you soon. Talk to you soon.